Good evening. Today, President Trump refused to say whether he's willing to talk to Russia. Special counsel Robert Mueller. We begin tonight keeping him honest with what seems to be his justification and whether there's anything to it. It comes down to all the things that even after a year in office, the president simply cannot let go of, namely the election, his defeated opponent, his claim that her campaign collaborated with Russia, not his, and his belief that any claims to the contrary or even the mere investigation of such claims are either a hoax, a sham, a Democratic excuse for losing to him or an attempt to undercut his victory. Here's what he told Fox's John Roberts this afternoon when asked whether he's open to talking to the special counsel with or without special conditions. Uh, there has been no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russians or Trump and Russians. No collusion. Uh, when I watch you interviewing all the people leaving their committees, I mean, the Democrats are all running for office and they're trying to say this, that. But bottom line, they all say there's no collusion. And there is no collusion. And when you talk about interviews, uh, Hillary Clinton had an interview where she wasn't sworn in. She wasn't given the oath. They didn't take notes. They didn't record. And it was done on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, that's perhaps ridiculous. And a lot of people looked upon that as being uh, a very serious breach. And it really was. But again, I'll speak to attorneys. I can only say this. There was absolutely no collusion. Everybody knows it. Every committee. I've been in office now for 11 months. For 11 months, they've had this phony cloud over this administration, over our government. And it has hurt our government. It does hurt our government. It's a Democrat hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, the Democrats should have won because they have such a tremendous advantage in the Electoral College. So it was brought up for that reason. But it has been determined that there is no collusion and by virtually everybody. Well, he said the words no collusion eight times in a bit more than a minute. But that wasn't all. I want to play what he said next on its own so you can better see the president's reasoning and especially where it could lead. We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. So that's the bottom line. Why talk when there's nothing to talk about, he's saying. To begin with, he might not have a choice. The special counsel can always subpoena him. And despite what the president claims, there could be plenty to talk about. Before we go any further, here's the Webster's definition of collusion. Quote, secret agreement or cooperation, especially for an illegal or deceitful purpose, as in acting in collusion with the enemy. Now, keep that in mind so you can decide for yourself whether any of what we already know amounts to collusion. Such as this, from the charging document and the guilty plea of former campaign aide George Papadopoulos. Quote, through his false statements and omissions, defendant impeded the FBI's ongoing investigation into the existence of any links or coordination between individuals associated with the campaign and the Russian government's efforts to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. So there's that and Michael Flynn's guilty pleas for lying about contacts with Russians and some of the allegations in the other indictments, other than the indictments, we do, know, we do not fully know what, if anything, the special counsel has uncovered about collusion, nor what the congressional committees looking into this have learned. What we do know is simple. Neither the committees nor the special counsel's office have said anything, either directly accusing the president or his campaign or clearing them of anything. Now, back in November, Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein told Jake Tapper she had yet to see any evidence that the Trump campaign received from the Russians dirt on Hillary Clinton or any hacked emails. She did not clear anyone of colluding with Russians to interfere in the election. She did say that the investigation continues. And so did Republican Richard Burr, chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. We have more work to do uh, as it relates to collusion, but we're developing a clearer picture of uh, what happened. Well, that sentiment is echoed by his Democratic co-chair, Senator Mark Warner. We've successfully pressed for the full accounting of Russian cyber efforts to target our state electoral systems. And despite the initial denials of any Russian contacts during the election, this committee's efforts have helped uncover numerous and troubling high-level engagements between the Trump campaign and Russian affiliates many of which have only been revealed in recent months. So that doesn't sound like the all clear on collusion, nor does this just today from former NSA and CIA Director Michael Hayden, who's worked with Democratic and Republican presidents. It, it, it's not a hoax. It's not all created by Democrats. 
I mean, there, there is now historical record, on which we can all agree that, that there were contacts between the campaign and agents of the Russian Federation, that there was some cooperation, some synchronization of activity between the campaign, the Russians, and WikiLeaks. Now, whether it's collusion or a criminal, a completely different matter, but there is some there there. And what's struck me about the president's comments is he needs, he wants, he should be pursuing closure. And he doesn't get closure until he talks to Bob Mueller. And to that point, just a reminder, none of us, not even the president, knows when this will end. There are no expiration dates, and it seems no room for the president to claim vindication until all the facts are known. Another view now from California Congressman Adam Schiff, ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee. I spoke to him earlier this evening. Congressman Schiff, President Trump's claim that Democrats all say there's no collusion and that the investigation is, quote, a phony cloud hanging over his administration and Democrat hoax is your position that there is no collusion and that the investigation is a phony cloud? Of course not. Uh, the president seems to repeat this as a mantra, no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. Uh, in the interview he did a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, I think he said it uh, some 16 or more times uh, as if he could simply wish it away. But look, we found scores of meetings that the Trump campaign said they never had. Uh, we've had uh, Trump official after Trump official uh, lie about those meetings. Uh, two already plead guilty to lying about those meetings. Um, and, of course, uh, a pivotal meeting in Trump Tower with three of the top campaign people that was uh, undertaken with the promise of obtaining dirt from the Russians on Hillary Clinton as part of what was described as the Russian government effort to help the Trump campaign. Uh, so, no, the president is uh, certainly wrong, but... Uh, He's not alone in being wrong on that issue. I mean, the fact that the president wouldn't say whether he'd be willing to meet uh, with Mueller or Grant Mueller in an interview, does that give you any kind of pause just in terms of how cooperative the president really wants to be with the special counsel? Well, I have to imagine that both the president uh, and his team of lawyers are desperately concerned about any interview that he might give under oath uh, to the special counsel. Uh, after all, this is a president who says one thing in the morning and uh, will say something at times completely different to only hours later uh, and has made some, I think, very potentially incriminating uh, comments, uh, you know, such as the one that he gave to Lester Holt about his motivation in firing James Comey. So I can certainly understand the White House concern. At the same time, I understand the imperative of special counsel in conducting this interview. It's not something you can ask a, a witness like this to do in writing. Uh, if you ask the president to respond to questions in writing, what you're really getting uh, are the lawyer's answers and not the president's answers. Finally, I, I mean, I know the investigation is ongoing. Way back in March, though, last year, you said that you had seen, quote, more than circumstantial evidence uh, that people connected to the president colluded with Russia to interfere in the 2016 election. Where do you stand on that now? Have you seen any more than just circumstantial evidence? Yes. And, I, you know, I think that if you look at even what is in the public domain, um, it, you really have to be willfully blinding yourself or uh, crediting every self-serving explanation of the Trump people uh, to ignore the evidence that is before us. Uh, here you have, as early as April, the Russians approaching George Papadopoulos and informing uh, the Trump campaign through one of its few foreign policy advisors that they have dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of stolen emails. That was told to the Trump campaign before even the Clinton campaign was aware of it. Uh, and you have that Trump campaign person lying to federal agents about it. Uh, you have Mike Flynn meeting or discussing rather secretly with the Russian ambassador ways to undermine the bipartisan policy of the United States vis-a-vis -vis sanctions over Russia's in intervention in the election, um, and then lying about that. Uh, you also have, of course, that meeting in Trump Tower. Uh, you have the connections with WikiLeaks, the fact that after the Trump Tower meeting, almost immediately after, uh, you see Julian Assange first, the first time acknowledging receipt of these stolen emails that we now know came from the Russians. So there is ample evidence in the public record that on the issue of collusion. The only issue really is what's the strength of that evidence? What will, for example, George Papadopoulos have to say? What will Mike Flynn have to say? What will these other witnesses have to say when we bring them in, if we're allowed to bring them in? That will tell us how strong is the evidence. Uh, and in the absence of that, it's very hard to, um, to be able to say, um, this is what I predict the evidence will be at the end of the investigation. So uh, ju just to kind, of, uh, ex to kind of just drill down on that a little bit, essentially you're saying you've seen indications of collusion, the possible indications of collusion, uh, how, how real it is, you're not willing to say at this point. Well, you know, I think we have seen evidence of collusion. 
The question is ultimately for Bob Mueller, is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt uh, such that he would feel comfortable seeking an indictment or seeking to go before a jury and make the case? For us in Congress, it's not a question of beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a question of what evidence do we find on the issue of collusion uh, that we need to present to the American people and what conclusions can we draw from it, whether or not it amounts to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Is there enough evidence, in your opinion, so far in the public record? I mean, you talked about this not as on a legal basis, but on a political basis for, for Congress for impeachment. Uh, You know, I'm reserving judgment on what we'll ultimately find, and and I voted against the impeachment resolution we have in the House because I think we need to finish our investigation and determine the strength of the evidence and what the consequences are that ought to flow from that. And I know I said finally, but just this really will be the final question. The the testimony that was released by Senator Feinstein uh, from the founders of of Fusion GPS, does that put an end to the Republican argument that uh, this, this so-called dossier, this series of memos, uh, was the work uh, of, of Hillary Clinton, was done at the behest. I mean, obviously, uh, the Clinton campaign uh, did pay money uh, after this uh, research was already begun by, uh, by Republicans. I mean, it won't put an end to it because this is really not based on fact. This is based on the desire to create a political narrative Uh, to distract attention, frankly, from what the Russians did and the connections between the Russians and the Trump campaign. So I don't imagine that any amount of evidence is going to deter at least some members of the House and some members of the Senate from trying to make this all about the government. And and Anderson, I was a prosecutor for six years. I've seen this uh, gambit before. When the facts are bad against your client, uh, then you try to put the government on trial. And that's really what the GOP is trying to do here. Um, The problem is... Um, The White House is not their client. At least it shouldn't be. Uh, We shouldn't be prosecutors. They shouldn't be defense counsel. We should all be investigators here. But unfortunately, that is not the role, I think, that that many of my colleagues are taking on. Congressman Schiff, I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks, Anderson. Well, just ahead, legal views from across the spectrum on the president's no collusion claim and his non-commitment about talking to Robert Mueller. Later, we have breaking news from California. So many people lost their lives in mudslides. The death toll now rising. We'll have a live update on the search for survivors. In need of great talent for your business, but short on time, you don't have to get lost in a huge stack of resumes to find your perfect hire. You just need the right tools, smarter tools. It can be challenging finding great talent to make your business successful. ZipRecruiter posts your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. Then ZipRecruiter actively looks for the most qualified candidates and invite them to apply. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. ZipRecruiter the smartest way to hire. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. One more time. To try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. So the president today suggested there might not be any reason to talk with Russia special counsel Robert Mueller because the president seems to believe there's nothing to talk about. No collusion, he says, between his campaign and the Russians, therefore nothing to say. Now, leaving aside the reality that he might not have a choice in the matter, he could be subpoenaed, that he could be compelled to talk. What the president said today differs from what he said before about cooperating with Mueller. Here's what the president said in June. And to be fair, he digresses a bit, but seems to come back on the point at the end. Would you be willing to speak under oath to uh, give your version of, of 100%. these events? 100%. I didn't say under oath. I hardly know the man. I'm not going to say I want you to pledge allegiance. Who would do that? Who would ask a man to pledge allegiance under oath? I mean, think of it. I hardly know the man. It doesn't make sense. No, I didn't say that, and I didn't say the other. You I would, would be, be glad to, to tell him exactly what I just told you. Well, let's get legal perspective now from former Trump White House lawyer Jim Schultz, former Obama ethics czar Norm Eisen, and Georgetown University Law School's Carrie Cordero. She's a CNN legal analyst as well. Jim, would you advise the president to resist being interviewed by the special counsel? I think this is a lot about the president taking advice from his lawyers at this point in time. The president said that he would speak with the with the special counsel. He said that in the past, and now he's pulling that back a little bit, probably at the behest of his lawyers, because what's going to happen here at the end of the day, the same thing that happened 
during the during the uh, Bush administration, when George W. Bush was interviewed by Special Counsel Patrick Fitzgerald in the Oval Office for 70 minutes, a negotiation is going to take place about the time, the scope of the inquiry, what questions, what what what, what uh, topics can be discussed. All of this is going to be negotiated out by lawyers. So this and, may be part of whether or not posturing for negotiation. You're saying. Yeah, I think it probably is. At the end, it's probably going to be a negotiation as to whether the president goes before Mueller and his team or not. And to the extent that he does go before the team, I would expect his lawyers are going to negotiate that out. Right, as much as they can. Ambassador Eisenhower, do you believe the president has grounds to resist being interviewed by the special counsel? And to Jim's point, do you think this is kind of an opening gambit or part of a gambit in a negotiation? Uh, Anderson, thanks for having me back. Uh, I I think Jim does have a good point that the president now is uh, playing bad cop a little bit uh, to help his lawyers in the negotiation. He does not have grounds to resist. It's not just his public statement. Uh, Mueller can subpoena him. He has no legal grounds after U.S. v. Nixon. After all, that was also a uh, subpoena to a president. Uh, unanimously, the Supreme Court said the president has to answer it. Mueller knows that he can haul the president before a grand jury with a subpoena. So it's not a real negotiation. Uh, the president's lawyers have one hand tied behind their back. They'll try to get the best deal they can as to scope, subject, time, location. But that interview is going to happen, Anderson, because there's a lot of evidence of obstruction and it can't be resolved without understanding the president's intent. Was it corrupt or not? Kerry, who do you uh, think has the most leverage? I don't leverage? know there's a lot of... It. Sorry, just who do you think, Kerry, has the most leverage in this situation, the White House or the special counsel? Because obviously, if the president is subpoenaed, the, the, well, I mean, one of the, the problems with that for, for the president is his lawyers then would not be present. Right. In my view, the special counsel has the upper hand in this negotiation. Certainly the details will need to be worked out um, in terms of what the subject matter of a particular interview is, the timing, the location, who's present. All those sorts of things are up for negotiation um, and will be worked out. But I do think the special counsel, if the special counsel determines for his investigation that they need to interview the president, and I don't think that's something that they would do lightly. They understand the gravity of interviewing the president of the United States and all that is involved with that. Um, but if they determine they need to, then they they have already what's been reported is they've already communicated to the White House counsel's office and the president's lawyers that they want to interview him. And it's just a matter of when. Now, it might be that the president's office wants to delay. I can't imagine that the president is in any rush to want to be interviewed by the special counsel, nor really would any president. So they might want to delay it. They might want to put it off. But at the end of the day, if the special counsel wants to interview him, um, they will be able to. Jim, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your former boss, White House counsel Don McGahn, who seems to be caught up in all of this, what he knows, what he doesn't know. Do you believe McGahn would put his own credibility or integrity at stake to protect the president? Because, I mean, his job is he is not the president's personal attorney. He is the attorney for the office of the president. Don McGahn has been a stabilizing force in the White House from day one. He's a tremendous White House counsel. He's done a very good job. He had a dis- the, the reports of him having a discussion with Jeff Sessions were entirely appropriate. You had, a, you had a White House counsel who was talking with a member of the cabinet about a legal issue related to a recusal. It's much, in, much ado about nothing. And I, I think the president has a right to be a little frustrated because he wants to get back and, uh, about the Russia collusion talk because he wants to get back to talking about the 12 circuit judges that he had confirmed. He wants to get back to talk about putting people back to work. He wants to get back to talking about transportation infrastructure, people getting bigger paychecks as a result of tax reform. None of that happens while you're talking about collusion. A- Ambassador, would it have been legal all this time if the president is son, Don Jr., Jared Kushner, perhaps others, were talking about all this? I mean, wh- whether it's Russian obstruction... Uh, making sure their stories match up. Is that technically allowed? Um, Anderson, that kind of effort to line your stories up and obscure the truth uh, is a classic part of an obstruction of justice pattern. And that's why uh, emerging evidence continues to come out about the president himself on Air Force One trying to shape Don Jr.'s story about the notorious meeting at Trump Tower between Don Jr. and the other campaign officials and the Russians uh, is so concerning 
There is a tremendous, that and other evidence, a tremendous amount of obstruction evidence. My goodness, we have evidence. The president of the United States asked the FBI director, can you see your way clear to letting uh, Flynn go? And when he didn't do it, he fired Jim Comey. He cried out in the Oval Office, where is my Roy Cohn? I mean, this is a president who seemingly uh, had something to hide, but there's no way to know for sure without Bob Mueller sitting across the table, looking him in the eye, asking him the questions, engaging his answers and his credibility. Was he intending to obstruct or not? Kerry, I mean, there's the criminal standard that Robert Mueller is looking at. Then Congress has the constitutional standard that doesn't necessarily have to dovetail precisely with Mueller's standard. What do you think the White House is more concerned about or should be more concerned about right now? Which standard? Well, I think they're they're probably most concerned about legal uh, exposure with the special counsel's case, because the special counsel's investigation, as far as what we know, it looks like it's covering several different areas, ranging from potential violations of possibly Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which involved the hacking aspect and whether there was any advanced knowledge of that, to obstruction, to financial crimes, to foreign agents registration. So there is a lot of legal exposure. Um, not all of that is directed at the president. Some of that is directed to individuals who were involved in the campaign, others potentially who still work in the White House. So there's a lot of legal exposure here. But of course, institutionally, for the office of the presidency, and this is what the White House counsel would be most concerned with, is the potential issue for uh, the Congress to take it up as a matter of impeachment. Mm. But, um, but, but so those are, those are two different right considerations, both serious in their own way. All right, we got to leave it there. I appreciate everybody just ahead after a week of explosive stories about the Trump White House. The president says that libel laws ought to be changed. I want to give a quick spoiler alert. That's not something he can actually do. I'll have details on that ahead. The Situation Room is the command center for politics and breaking news. Join me, Wolf Blitzer, for extraordinary reports from around the world. The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, weekdays at 5 Eastern on CNN. President Trump was venting again today, possibly taking a swipe at Michael Wolf's new book or the recent reporting on the so-called dossier or both. Here's what he had to say. Our current libel laws are a sham and a disgrace and do not represent American values or American fairness. So we're going to take a strong look at that. Uh, We want fairness. Uh, You can't say things that are false, knowingly false, and uh, be able to smile as money pours into your bank account. We're going to take a very, very strong look at that. And I think uh, what the American people want to see is fairness. Now, keep in mind, this is coming from someone who spent more than a year lying about where former President Obama was born. He also pushed, of course, the theory that Ted Cruz's father was involved in the Kennedy assassination, which actually happened. But anyway, keeping him honest, even if he wanted to, there's not much President Trump or any president, for that matter, can actually do about libel laws, barring any new actions by the Supreme Court or a constitutional amendment. It's hardly a new thing for Donald Trump. Before he was president, he had a long history of threatening to take legal action against nearly anything written about him that he didn't like. It's a history President Trump's biographer, Michael D'Antonio, knows well. He joins us now, along with David Gergen, an advisor to President's Republican and Democrat. So, David, I mean, obviously no president ever likes their press coverage, really, or everything that's written about them. To go so far as to suggest changing libel laws, which is not something the president can actually just unilaterally do, is odd or disturbing, to say the least. I agree. Let's go back to the basics. The the libel laws in this country are controlled by a case decided by the Supreme Court in 1964 called the New York Times versus Sullivan. It was a nine nothing decision, Anderson, which said that in order to for a public figure to sue somebody for libel and succeed, you not only had to prove that the statement, uh, the critical statement was was you know, false. But you also have to prove actual malice that the person or the, in, uh, the publication uh, making the critical statement knowingly you know, d- misdescribed or did it with malice. Uh, I must tell you that every president I've known the last 40 years, as at one time or another I've heard say in private, I sure wish the New York Times Sullivan case were d- decided differently. I'd sure like to change the laws. But I can't remember any of them going public. 
uh, with that kind of, because it's a, it's a nine nothing decision, and it's 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 a bulwark of our press freedom uh, and our and our and, and our just general freedom of speech. So, uh, and, and Washington Post has reported today now that as of the as as of this time since Pre- President Trump took office. He has issued at least 2001 misleading or false statements. Things like crooked Hillary. Uh, Doesn't that sound def- def- defaming, defaming? And I must tell you, finally, when I mentioned at the dinner table tonight that uh, I was going to talk about President Trump calling for a tightening of the libel laws, my wife burst out laughing. Mm. Michael, I mean, it, as a citizen, Donald Trump, and you knew him uh, well as a biographer, I mean, he talked about libel laws. He's been uh, you know, annoyed about press coverage for a long time. Well, he's been annoyed about press coverage since the 1970s. The very first journalist to really uh, investigate Donald Trump received threatening phone calls from him, and he's threatened lawsuits and brought lawsuits in every decade since then. So this is a person who is a very aggressive uh, litigator when it comes to the press, and yet he never seems to learn having lost in these cases or had them thrown out. He was even once lectured by a judge on the price that famous and powerful people pay in our society for their fame and power. The judge said, well, this is one of the parts of our system that keeps the powerful honest. And Yet he doesn't seem to accept that it actually is very American to do this, even though he claims that it's uh, against what most Americans would expect from their country. David, I I want to focus on the president's wording today. He said current libel laws are, quote, a sham and a disgrace and do not represent American values or American Mm -hmm. fairness. I wonder what you make of that, tying this to American values. Because, again, I mean, it does bear repeating. This is a, a president who you know, was a leader pushing the false idea that President Obama, you know, was not American. Uh, absolutely. And uh, look, there's nothing more American than our than our libel laws. We do set a higher standard. Uh, we require more of a plaintiff, somebody who's been accused, than, say, the United Kingdom it does. Uh, but nonetheless, it's ver- it, the, the libel laws are very consistent with our values, the value of free speech. We have a robust rock em sock em kind of democracy. That's who we are. And we also have a freedom of press, which has been a bulwark for our freedom for a long time. Uh, just look at the whole movie of The Post now. It's, it, it's uh, getting so much attention. So, uh, you know, it, it's just sort of like I don't know why the president needs to go down this path when he's not his administration is not going to change the laws. It, and, you know, he he said he was going to go after all those women who went after him during the campaign. Right. He hasn't filed one of those suits. This is sort of just a throwaway comment meant to put a little more fuel on the fire, keep a, keep us distracted in one thing or another. It's not a serious conversation. Yeah, and you could argue it's also to intimidate or to kind of look tough in order for, for his supporters, but there's no real follow-through on it. Uh, we're going to end it there. Michael D'Antonio, yeah. David Gergen, thanks very much. Just a question ahead. If offshore drilling is now not going to happen off the coast of Florida... Why not other states? The governor of Oregon certainly wants to know, except she says no one in Trump world is returning her phone calls. We'll talk to her ahead. Well, we all know that it helps to have friends in high places. So in Florida's Republican governor, Rick Scott, a close political ally, obviously, of President Trump, said he absolutely positively did not like the Trump administration's decision to allow offshore drilling to begin anew in his state. Presto, the decision was quickly reversed. Democrats wondered if this had anything to do with the notion that Scott may be thinking about running for the Senate later this year against Democrat Bill Nelson and that President Trump wanted to do Scott a political favor or that the president wants to keep Republican voters in Florida on his side. Not in the least, said a spokesman for the Interior Department. Not at all. But other governors of coastal states are now saying, wait a minute, what about us? We don't want drilling here either. Among those governors, Oregon's Kate Brown, who I spoke with just before air. Governor, do you have any understanding as to why Florida would be removed from the offshore drilling plan and not other coastal states? Absolutely not. In what universe would this be okay? Uh, Our coastal beaches are really important to Oregonians. Uh, They are publicly accessible and have been uh, for over 100 years. They're very much a part of who we are, and they're very important for our economy. So I don't know why it's okay for Florida And not okay for Oregon. Yeah, according to Secretary Zinke, Florida is, quote, unique and its coasts are heavily reliant on tourism as an economic driver. 
Um, I mean, Oregon's coasts seem incredibly unique to me and obviously are a big draw for tourists <laughs> as well. Well, I welcome you to come visit Oregon and I love see our Oregon. Yeah, I know them. Uh, I love them. 362 miles of stunning coastline. Last year, a $2 billion industry and over 22,000 jobs on the coast. These communities are really struggling to recover since the recession. Uh, obviously, tourism is key. So are our natural resources industry on the coast. Um, so my question is to Secretary Zinke, why is this okay for Florida and not okay for Oregon? Is this In what politics? universe is this okay? I mean, is this about electoral politics? Absolutely. What can I... What can I think otherwise? Is it about the governor uh, wanting to run for the U.S. Senate? Or is it, a, is it about President Trump wanting to protect Mara Largo? I don't know the answer to that because Secretary Zinke hasn't returned our calls. Really? You, you called he hasn't returned them? We have not heard from them. There was absolutely no input uh, from governors, uh, coastal governors, we had no uh, clue that this was coming, and we had no opportunity to express our outrage. We are outraged. This is absolutely unacceptable. There has been no drilling off the Pacific coast for three decades. That's because in 1984 there was a horrible spill in Santa Barbara area impacting wildlife and impacting the beaches. This is absolutely not okay. Oregonians are outraged. The entire West Coast is outraged. This does not reflect our values, and this does not reflect our future. Secretary Zinke has apparently t- talked to the, the Florida governor, has, and he said that if other governors would like to request meetings with the secretary, they're welcome to do so. Um, that's something, obviously, I assume you would want to do if they were willing to return your calls. I would certainly be delighted to meet with Secretary Zinke. We would love to have our input on this policy. It impacts our people. It impacts our economy. It impacts our tourism. And I would love to share my thoughts with Secretary Zinke and look forward to meeting with him if he'll return our phone calls. Is this something you would take to court? Uh, We will look at every single tool that we have in the toolbox. Like I said, um, the beaches, Oregon's coastline, as you know, it's stunning. It is really a part of who we are as a people. It's critically important for our economy. It feeds our souls. We want to protect it. We want to make sure that future generations of Oregonians can enjoy it. Governor Brown, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's check in with Chris Cuomo with a preview of what's ahead on Cuomo Prime Time. Hey, Chris. Anderson Cooper, fan of the Oregon coastline. I like the Oregon coastline. Have you been? I believe it. Have you been to Bay? I have. I was usually on the job there, but I'm sure that you have gone there and experienced in a way better than I have. Yeah, I'm a big beachgoer. I believe that. I (laughs) sense your tan. Uh, So tonight, we can't talk about Anderson all the time, although it might help the ratings. What we're going to do is we're going to test. We're going to go one-on-one with Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway. She says that she could make the case that the president wants to unite this country, and it's the media that's keeping him from doing it. And a controversial former Sheriff Joe Arpaio. He says he is the man to represent Arizona in the U.S. Senate. You'll remember President Trump pardoned him. He's ready to make the case to the American people. He'll get the chance to do that right here, Anderson. Wow, two big interviews. Definitely want to watch that. Chris, thanks very much. All right. All right. Up next on 360, a massive wall of mud striking homes, burying people, cars in an instant. Tonight, the death toll is climbing. The latest from Southern California in a moment. The death toll has risen in the California mudslides and the stories of loss emerging from the debris of lives and property are simply heartbreaking. Intense rain led to the new disaster in a region already hard hit by weeks of wildfires. The sea of mud covered homes and cars in an instant, taking at least 17 lives with it. Hundreds are now searching, 10 dogs looking for survivors or more likely the missing who simply did not make it. Our Paul Verkamen is there. He joins us now. Paul, what's the latest? Well, Anderson, as you pointed out, that death toll has risen to 17. And behind me in the blackness, there was a house, but it was literally blasted off its foundation by a raging torrent in that debris field. You see wood, trees, boulders and more. In all, they say that 100 houses were destroyed and another 300 damaged 
uh, this is an absolute uh, devastating uh, disaster of extreme magnitude. It spans some 19,000 acres. The wall of mud came in the middle of the night. Just obliterated this little neighborhood um, to turn the houses into matchsticks, blew them off their foundation and threw them up against trees. Survivors became heroes. We heard a, a little baby cry. And, uh, Fire came over and uh, dug down, found a little baby. I don't know where it came from. Uh, we got it out, got the mud out of its mouth. I hope it's okay. They took it right to the hospital. But it was just a baby four feet down in the mud in nowhere under the rocks. I'm glad we got it. But who knows what else is out there. There were many more in need out there, like the family in this house surrounded by mud water. The youngest survivor, a newborn baby. All five in the family rescued, others still searching for their loved ones. We're just going to go down the creek and see what we can find. This man's mother was swept away while clinging to the back door of her home. I thought she'd be all right. She was in the, in the voluntary evacuation. What made this mudslide so horrendous? The steepness of the terrain. Look up there, the Thomas Fire burn zone above Montecito. It goes from 3,000 feet to sea level in just several miles. So the water came off those ashy hillsides and just poured right through here. It had a high velocity, as they call it. And you can look right over here, and you'll see where the waters, just a little bit more than a mile from the ocean, took a house right off its foundation. Other houses swallowed by mud or destroyed by fire. Highway 101, the main freeway connecting Los Angeles and San Francisco, in a moment was turned into a river of mud and boulders. In all, hundreds of homes destroyed or damaged in a natural disaster covering 19,000 acres. And tonight, many families grieve while others simply hope that their loved ones will find their way home. Paul, if you can hear me, I mean, you, Anderson, I don't know if ahead. you can hear me. Go ahead, Paul. You're on the air. Go ahead. No, I, I go ahead. I can hear you now. Is there hope? Uh, Anderson, what I was going to tell you is, is behind. Go ahead, Paul. I think what you're alluding to is their hope to find any victims. And uh, sorry about that transmission. There is a glimmer of hope, but it's search and rescue. And it's now more search than rescue. They know that 13 people are still missing. But as each hour passes in this darkness, uh, the hope starts to fade. We did see behind me rescue crews go through here using all manner of different implements to sort of move around the rubble. They had their search dogs out. We didn't see them pull uh, anybody out, but we heard that there were three successful rescues today, Anderson. And, and was there any warning for, for these mudslides? There definitely was. It's a two-step dance with the devil. They know that first you get the wildfire and then come the slides because those hills have been stripped of vegetation. They had both voluntary uh, evacuations and mandatory evacuations, but there just was so much rain in a short amount of time. And nearby Carpinteria, at one point, they got uh, basically a full inch of rain in one hour, and that just sent this torrent through at one point. 600 emergency calls in the middle of the night, just too much for everyone to deal with. That's incredible. Paul Verkamen, I'm glad you're there. Thank you. Coming up, the president claims he got letters from anchors congratulating him on his performance in yesterday's immigration meeting. Sounds like something best dealt with on The Ridiculous. That's next. Time now for The Ridiculous. And tonight, the reviews are in. Because really, what is a bipartisan immigration reform meeting other than an episode of The Apprentice without the theme song and the commercials and Omarosa being herself, which is to say odious. Yesterday, cameras were rolling for that meeting between lawmakers and the president, the meeting in which the president showed his understanding of immigration policy by agreeing with Democrats until the Republicans reminded him he shouldn't, so he reversed himself, but then moments later went back to agreeing with Democrats. Anyway, today, the president talked about the coverage of that meeting. Got great reviews by everybody other than two networks who were phenomenal for about two hours. Then after that, they were called by their bosses and say, oh, wait a minute. And unfortunately, a lot of those anchors sent us letters saying that was one of the greatest 
meetings they've ever witnessed. And they were great. For about two hours, they were phenomenal. And then they went a little bit south on us, but not that bad. It was fun. Uh, they probably wish they didn't send us those letters of congratulations, but it was good. I'm sure their ratings were fantastic. They always are. First of all, major kudos to the United States Postal Service for delivering those letters so fast. So fast, it's almost like it wouldn't even be humanly possible. Quick question, though. Who are these anchors who wrote letters congratulating the president on one of the greatest meetings they've ever witnessed, which is a highly believable, totally normal thing that would absolutely happen? Letter writing and how to sharpen a feathered quill pen is the first thing they teach us in anchor school. Little known fact. For the record, I didn't write a letter. Everyone knows when I want to do something totally normal, I send the president one of those big cookies with congratulations on the meeting and icing or one of those edible arrangements filled with cantaloupe, which I personally think is really just a filler fruit. Anyway, Which anchors wrote letters? I'll ask everyone the next time we all get together on one of our semi-annual cruises. It's called Anchors Away. (laughs) It's true. Hannity hangs out in the vape room. Blitzer makes my ties. O'Donnell complains about the sound of the engine knocking. (laughs) Sounds like hammering. We have fun. Cena and Jim Acosta asked the White House to back up the president's claim that he received letters from anchors. This is how the White House actually responded, with a list of two CNN videos and 19 tweets. Now, to be fair... This list does have words on it, and those words are actually made up of letters, but that's not generally accepted in reality to mean the same thing as, quote, letters of congratulation that anchors sent to the president. As for the White House's list of tweets, 18 out of 19 are not actually from anchors, and 19 out of 19 are not letters. And the congratulations heaped on the president in this list of tweets? Well, here's one from a Daily Mail editor. 55-minute pool spray. Is that a record? That's a textbook congratulations letter. Here's another letter that the president received from an anchor. It's a tweet from a BuzzFeed editor. I am so torn by what's happening on CNN and MSNBC right now. On the one hand, this isn't a pool spray. It's a whole ass hour long meeting. On the other hand, that's kind of a good thing that this debate is happening in front of cameras. That was on the White House list, as was this from CNN political commentator Patty Solis Doyle. I don't know about you, but I'm riveted by this bipartisan meeting on DACA. After the White House used her tweet as backup for the president's claim today, she tweeted this. For the record, I also find the Real Housewives of New York riveting. It doesn't mean I think Countess Luann should be running the country. Also, I'm not an anchor, and a tweet is not a letter. Not quite the stamp of approval the president claimed, but of, but of this you can be certain. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night will keep us from our pointed rounds on the ridiculous. And that's it for us. Thanks for watching. Time to hand it over to Chris Cuomo. Cuomo Primetime starts right now. Chris?